Oh my god, peeps, what an unmitigated disaster this video has turned out to be so far. Greetings Jeepers, it's Green Dot 319. How are we all doing? Welcome to the great outdoors. Today we're going to look at something a little bit different. We're going to look at how I spent $1,200 on my butt. And we're also going to look at how a plate of fish and chips helped me decide to do that as well, okay? If that isn't British enough for you, I don't know what is. We're also going to look at a little bit of driving today because I don't often just show you driving around the Jeep. And as the weather's coming into spring and it's beautiful here, I thought you might just like to see us uh, trying out this uh, Solex powered uh, Jeep and putting it through a bit of a, a long run as we go out um, today. First off, thanks subscribers for joining us today. I really appreciate your support. If you're not subscribed yet and you want to be kept up to date with uh, videos, just click down the left-hand corner there on the click me button. That'll uh, let you know when I release new videos and things like that. It'll also uh, keep you up to date with my posts that I put on YouTube. And if you really want to support the channel and just help me out for a buck a month um, to help create content and keep the Jeep going and things like that, join me on Patreon with my Patreon army. We chat on there, I give information, I put extra information I don't put on here and videos as well. So if you want to um, help support me in just a little way I'd really appreciate that. Um, let's go and do a little bit of driving to start off with because we don't often take this out and just drive it and enjoy it so let's go and go around the English countryside at the moment and film a bit of that you'll really like to see um, spring around here it's absolutely beautiful so let's start off with that then.
my god peeps what an unmitigated disaster this video has turned out to be so far so i'll try and tidy this up because i filmed all sorts of weird bits here right we drove from the gorge where we started over the mendit great about 30 miles lovely jeep running absolutely beautifully running great with the solex carb just so you know the power is fantastic and what have you pulled up to a place i thought we'd film this video okay about about wasting 1200 quid on your butt okay so we get there and we pull into this car park to film this bit and we're all going to do it to start off with there's some sort of plague of flying beasts going on i'm not entirely sure what's happened it's the first warm day it's only about 20 degrees centigrade like 70 fahrenheit or something like that the bugs have all decided today is orgy day or something like that so i'm covered in these flying midge things right to start off with then people start appearing and then the happy days bus appears next to me as well in the car park so i'm trying to film and i just I'm going to give up, I'm going to drive off somewhere else. Try to start the Jeep, starts and then just dies. Well peeps, this video has taken an interesting change. It wasn't going uh, exactly how we were wanting, so I was going to move on a little bit, but I tried to take the Jeep away and it looks like she's got vapor lock because she won't start at all. And I can't get any fuel to pump into the bowl. So if you come down to the pump, priming pump here, it should all be filled up and everything like that. But look, I can, usually it would stop, but I can continually fill and it's not, going over and into the Venturi or anything like that. So there is no fuel reaching the carburetor at the moment. Um, I cracked this line here and it was just blowing a tiny little bit. So it does look like it's vapor lock and I've never had that before. We've driven about, done about 30 miles today, pretty hot. It's 20 degrees centigrade, so it's not exactly hot, hot, but obviously the Jeep has got hot and vapor lock. So we're gonna have to try and solve this then. So the next thing to do, I think, is to take the top off the um, fuel pump and have a look and see if anything comes out of there and we can pump down there and try and eliminate things. But you know, really, I think it's just gonna be a, a matter of letting it sit here and try and cool down as much as possible, but it's not gonna be great, is it? If we wanna be using this and it's on a 30 mile run, she's got a bit hot already and vapor locked. Never had a problem with the GPW, never had a problem with this Jeep ever before. So this is the first time ever, strange. What we don't wanna do, peeps, I think is just, if you've got a problem like this, whether it's electrical or fuel or anything like that, what you don't wanna do is keep winding away at the starter trying to get it to run. You need to get what's wrong with it fix before you try the starter okay because there's no point in just winding down your battery especially if you're on six volt if the problem isn't solved okay and in this case we can see it hasn't got fuel pumping it is not pumping any fuel up so let's have a look in this bowl and see if there's anything down here without burning myself because everything is very very hot okay if fuel comes pouring out as well it's just going to fall down it's not going to go on anything hot and catch on fire so i think we're all right and push it into the lake anyway right off you come cover this is where the clear cover you know you get the glass cover that would be useful here because i wouldn't have to do this i could just look in it but this is the original metal cover so oh yeah this there's fuel coming out you know there's some fuel in there let's see if we have, what happens when we pump it yeah i mean she ain't pumping she ain't pumping Hey, uh, well, I think we've got to let it cool, really. We could start going further upstream and things like that, but really, there's not a huge amount I can do here, I don't think. Del, yeah, it had enough fuel. The fuel would have been up to here, so that's what fell out, but there wasn't anything beyond it, and when you're pumping it, it's not pumping any more out, so it's, it's a fuel vapor lock problem by the looks of it, a fuel supply problem. Great. What do you reckon, peeps? I reckon it's not pumping, and I can feel it's pumping, so it's not like just blowing the fuel, fuel's coming through and it's, it's leaking inside the crankcase or anything like that, so we don't need to worry about that. So, and it, I don't think it's this line here because it's not getting to the pump, so it'll be the front line going up to the fuel bowl, I reckon. So if we crack it at the fuel filter there and crack it up there and suck through, if there's any sort of lock, maybe that'll clear the lock and then we can restart pumping, because I reckon if I undo the fuel bowl, fuel will come out. I don't think that'll be the problem. I think it'll be this line here, this line which runs closest to the engine and gets hottest. So I'll crack it here, crack it up there, and then sadly we've got to get sucking and <laughs> see what happens, as they say. Right, let's do it. Damn you, Jeep gods. Why? I was trying to film a video, and this is not what I was trying to film. Vapor lock Jeeps was not part of it. Okay. Come on, you. I've got a really tight line here. Yeah, man. I don't want to break anything or crack anything. This is the, this is the next problem, of course, is snapping something by accident. So, there we go. Right, we'll crack you. Crack this one carefully. Yeah, fuel's coming. Put yeah. Okay, we've got fuel fizzing out of that one. Okay. Interesting. So when I cracked it, fuel just came 
fizzing out of it, all right? So there was a whole gush of fuel coming out of it there, which is interesting. So there was pressurization on this side, which does sort of lend that maybe there was a lock of some description in there or in the pump, okay? So we'll try and pump it through and see how far we get with that again. Let's try pump it again, see if it spurts out here. I need to see a whole, whole pretty much a spurt coming out of there for it to actually have done anything, so. Um, had a little bit there, but it's still, it seemed to be a little bit and then it's, it seemed might have done it again. All right, I'll tighten this up and then we'll try and we'll see if we can fill the uh, carb bowl up. <coughs> right, peeps, what do we reckon? Do you think that's gonna work or not? I'm not sure, I'm not holding my breath, all right? So, with the Solex, you've got to give it full accelerator when it's hot. To start off with, it's unlike the WO. When it's really hot, uh, it won't really start. So you give it loads of accelerator, because that's not doing an accelerator pump or anything like that. And that helps it start. So we'll do that, so it'll rev up when it starts, if it starts, all right? Oh, man. Oh, jeeps, eh? So, looks like we solved it then. So now I've got to rethink how we're going to do this video. I reckon go back, regroup, and then we can retry it, all right? Unbelievable. I've been home, I've had a cuppa, sorted myself out. We're going to try and film the rest of this video and get round to the 1,200 bucks, okay? Now, just starting it at home there, it wouldn't start again. Actually, it did start. It started fine. We got, got it going perfectly. Drank all the fuel out of the bowl, dead straight away. Vapor lock, exactly the same thing, exactly the same place. So we know this one is vapor locking for some reason on this, this specific circumstances today. Being warm, taking it out for long drives, it's heat soaking and vapor locking. Now, problem is why is it doing that? Well, we can have a look at that in a second. But one of the things I just want to talk about is um, when you're fault finding like that, do it methodically like we did there, okay? Don't just start ripping things off and uh, it's not working, running the starter down and things like that. You've only got a limited amount of starter on a six volt, you need to save it and look after it, okay? So you need to find the problem first and that's what we did there. It's not electric, it's not fuel, you know, there's not much else. That's all this thing needs to run pretty much. So if it's not starting, don't keep on trying. Delve into it a little bit, you know, take the horn off, see if there's fuel, see if the fuel pump is working. If it's electric, see if you've got ignition, see if you've got a spark, you know, just pull off one of your plug leads, spin it over, just see if you get the spark on it or something like that. Go from there, okay? If you start ripping it apart, you never work out what's going on. And we were able to solve that fairly straightforward there. And now I know if I have my um, half inch spanner, can just crack a line, get that vapor lock out of there and solve it. Problem is it shouldn't be vapor locking, okay? So let's have a look. Let's see what um, I've found and hopefully will help us out here. Okay then, first question, is it the Solex causing this? We've never had the problem before and the Jeep's done 800 miles so far. Well, I don't think so. We found the fuel problem is definitely downstream. It's down here, it's not up here. When it started, it started absolutely fine when it was just hot a second ago, used all that fuel out of that bowl and then died. So the Solex isn't causing any sort of starting problems that I can see if I use the, the correct Solex starting technique. It is this line here and it's not this one. This one's nice and clear, that was fine. It's the one here which runs from the fuel pump or runs to the fuel pump round the front of the engine where it's really hot all the way around and then comes under, where are we? There it is, down there, right next to the hot engine. I can feel the heat coming up here, it is very warm. And then he goes down there and up to the fuel filter, okay? So here's the fuel filter. So it, it's getting hot and uh, vapor locking here. Now, I never had a problem with the GPW. The only thing was, I've just um, moved the fuel line just there. It was touching the side of the engine, okay? Usually there's a bit of an air gap. You can see there's an air gap there. But imagine if it's touching it, you know, that heat transfers from the engine when the engine's got really hot, transfers straight into that fuel line, vaporizes that fuel, turns it into vapor and locks it. So that could be it. I'm hoping it is. We'll find out if we leave it here for a little while. We'll see if it starts again. If it was just simply that touching it there, then we should know. I mean, I can't think of, it's all the same as it was previously. There's nothing different. And you know, this is how they were in World War II. It has to be something like that. So we'll see how that goes. Finally, peeps, five hours later, I can tell you how fish and chips have got anything to do with seat cushions okay. Now, like fish and chips, here we go, you've got 
different options when it comes to buying fish and chips, okay? You can buy them from a cheaper place or a nicer place. And the whole idea was we went to a nice place today. We went by the lake where apparently thousands of billions of midges live. Um, we went there to buy the nice fish and chips, okay? It's a little bit more expensive, but it's still fish and chips. You can get it cheaper five miles down the road. Um, now th this is where this analogy dies down, okay? It doesn't work out. This is actually the cheaper fish and chips because the place I went to with the midges, the more expensive place, was closed today. <laughs> so, so the whole the whole thing doesn't work at the end of the day. This is the fish, the cheaper fish and chips. But what I'm talking about is the more expensive fish and chips, okay? You've got a choice. You can choose what you want to get. When it comes to these seat cushions, okay, there's the ones made um, by multiple companies you'll know about already, and they make excellent cushions. The um, All the um, canvas on them, is very similar, okay? I don't know if they probably use all the same supplier or something like that, or various, you know, close suppliers. The design and construction of them is all very good. If you choose one of the big names, you're not gonna have a problem, I don't think, whatsoever. But there is a difference with them, okay? Because there is another name you can use, which is Paolo in Italy at the Long Olive Drab Line, and he makes $1,200 seat cushions. Here they are for the Jeep. Not, you know, $300 or $400 or something like that. $1,200. Now, why would you pick $1,200 uh, seat cushions? I asked on YouTube and I said to people, I said, you know, what should I do? Should I buy the cheaper set like I used on the Ford GPW? Absolutely fantastic seat cushions, perfect, really awesome. Or should I spend the money and do the expensive cushions? And the answer came back as 50-50, yes, no. So that pretty much leaves it up to me, doesn't it? Whether I should uh, do it or not. So I thought about it and I chose to go the more expensive option. Okay, and I went with the, with the expensive ones. Why are these ones so expensive? Why are these 1200 bucks? They look the same, pretty much. There is a difference inside them, okay? In World War II photos, when you're looking at Jeeps, you can often see the springs inside the back of them. It's quite obvious. When you're looking at Jeeps and we're talking about how it looks and trying to make it look authentic, not just drive and, and be a great vehicle. We want it to look the part, okay? We want it, you know, the paint's gotta be that flat olive drab, the markings have gotta be right. The, all the details have got to be good as well. Seat cushions have been sort of ignored because no one's really doing it apart from Paolo, putting the springs inside them. When you look at the photos, you can see the springs are pretty obvious. When they're well used and dirty, these ones are new, no one's really sat in this seat or that seat. You can just possibly see from there a little bit of darkness appearing here where I'm sitting in this seat. When they're being used, you can start to see that uh, curve of the springs inside it. And it's really obvious and it's a really, big feature of them, I think, which is missing on a lot of restorations. So I thought I would go for it and I would, if I didn't go for it, if I didn't choose the expensive chips or the expensive seats, I would regret it in the long run, okay? There's a marginal, there is a, there's a difference in cost, but at the end of the day, all you'll think about, you won't think about the cost in the future, you'll think about the fact that you're not sitting on the spring seats with the horse hair inside them, built to exact specifications. These ones actually use original um, zips on them. Paolo got hold of original zips, the same ones that are fitted to the rifle rack on the front here um, would be with the windscreen. Original zips, original construction, horsehair and spring inside them. So if I didn't go for that, I think I would, I would always regret it, especially when I'm going to a restoration of this sort of magnitude here. I would always regret not uh, going for it. So I did. I spent the money and I bought the seat cushions and they're on here now. Now one of the things which um, has uh, I've noticed about it just uh, here is my five hour old fish and chips. You know, you talk about soggy Brit fish and chips. This is about, look at this. I think the bottom's actually falling out of it now. I'm gonna eat it. Don't let that put you off your food either. Um, one of the things which has come out of this, which I've noticed, which is why we did a bit of driving, was the fact that these are really, really comfortable actually. I'm gonna say, these are some of the more comfortable seats I've ever sat on. Now that, that sounds a bit funny, doesn't it? You'd be like, what is he talking about? That's, that can't be true. Seriously, spring and horsehair seats compared to sitting on the foam seats on a Jeep like I had on the GPW are very, very comfortable. Um, they soak up a lot of the bumps and um, you know roughness in the ride on a Jeep. And um, when I sit in it, when I was sitting driving out, you know, out to the lake earlier, I thought, geez, this is really nice. You know, I've got support in my lower back and things like that. It feels very soft. So. One of the extra perks of having these seats is not just that they're expensive and they're made correctly, they're actually better than the foam seats. Now, the outside of them may not look any different, but the ride you get is really, really good. Um, and it feels, you know, authentic. That's what we're going for is authentic ride. Now you can sit on your spring and horsehair seats and get your authentic ride. You know what? I think after five hours, this fish and chips is actually better than it was before. And this brings me to the fact that sometimes when things don't go right, you can actually have a better time or learn more than if things all went according to plan, okay? 
And people ask me about, you know, rebuilding Jeeps and what have you, and how did you learn how to do it? I learned by making mistakes and, you know, learning along the way. Same sort of thing with the vapor lock there. If we hadn't seen that, we wouldn't know how to solve it. Um, but now we've seen it, we've worked it out, worked through it methodically, and we've solved that problem, hopefully. I don't know if it really is solved down here, but I know how to sort it out when it does happen now, which is great. The same sort of thing here, you know, these chips and fish actually taste really, really good. And perhaps if I'd had the ones that I wanted to, the expensive ones, they, um, they wouldn't be quite as good as this. And I wouldn't be standing here quietly out in the middle of nowhere, enjoying myself eating my fish and chips. Now, how exactly I tie that now into buying expensive seat cushions? <laughs> Oh, excuse me. I don't know. But what I, excuse me, God, it's trying to kill me now. I think what you can take from it with the seat cushions then is even if you don't have the money and you don't want to spend that 1200 bucks on the really expensive seat cushions, as long as you're enjoying yourself and learning, it doesn't matter, does it? No one will ever notice really um, that the seat cushions aren't the more expensive ones or anything like that. They all look very similar. It's just the ride and when they're worn in a bit, they look a little bit different. But at the end of the day, as long as you're happy, it's your Jeep and you're enjoying yourself, what difference does it make? So you can spend 1200 quid on your butt if you want to, and it does work out all right. But at the same time, if things don't work out quite the way you plan them, or you don't spend 1200 quid on your butt, you can still have a good time and things will work out fine as well. So there you go. There's a life lessons about um, your butt and chips and midges and vapor lock and <coughs> inhaling fish and chips. But hope you all enjoyed that. Like and subscribe, join me next time, and we'll see where we end up.